In our last podcast, I mentioned that me and the other donut hosts will be in an upcoming Forza Horizon DLC, and I just wanted to correct some of the details that I gave out. Uh, the DLC will be coming out near the end of this year. It's a Horizon story, and it will be free for anyone who has the base game. You will definitely be able to drive high and low car and potentially some of our other stuff. Uh, so keep uh, your eyes out for that. This is honestly the coolest thing we've ever done. Uh, we're in a video game. This is so sick. We got our faces scanned. We had to shave our whole faces. Why Nolan and I looked weird in all the intros of High Low. It was the final leg of the 24 Hours of Le Mans in June of 2011. Audi Racing's newly named head engineer, Lena Gade, and her team were faced with a predicament that required them to make a quick and risky decision. Driver Andre Lottere was behind the wheel of the Audi R18 TDI Ultra when Gade informed him that the car had punctured a tire. Not the best news for a driver to hear while in first place in the last hour of a long and legendary race, especially when the other two cars run by Audi had crashed out. There were seemingly only two options, continue the race and maybe even win, but risk a dangerous blowout, or they could do a rapid tire change and lose their first place position. Ultimately, Gade chose logic and safety over almost guaranteed glory. Her fast acting team stepped up to the challenge. With a minuscule gap of time, Gade's crew changed all four of the car's tires and left the pit on fresh rubber. They remained in the lead, but were only seconds ahead of their competition. The risk paid off. It is victory for Audi number two. Andre Lodgera takes the win in the 2011 Le Mans 24 hours, and the margin of victory will be less than 15 seconds. As for engineer Lena Gade, she became the first female engineer to win the 24 hours of Le Mans, a victory she has repeated twice since. How did the daughter of Indian immigrants become an engineer for a world-renowned racing team? What other women paved the way for her groundbreaking victory? And what effect did her successes have on the future of women in motorsport? Today, we're going to find out. This week on Past Gas, Audi's championship engineer, Lena Gade. Past Gas Podcast. It's about cars, it's not about ports. Big thank you to our sponsor this week, Valvoline. When I was about seven years old, I got a Mega Blocks NASCAR set, and the livery on the car was Mark Martin's number six Valvoline livery. And ever since then, I thought Valvoline was such an awesome brand and company. And so I'm super stoked to partner with Valvoline here on the podcast. Valvoline was America's first motor oil brand, making it the original motor oil. Valvoline sponsors Donut Racing Formula Drift driver Adam Kanapik. He's our freaking shop foreman. He gets sideways. He goes real fast. And Valvoline sponsors him too. Man, I feel like a million bucks for being part of the Valvoline family. You can too. When you put Valvoline in your ride, you join a long line of Valvoline motorsports legends such as the Hendricks Motorsport team over there in NASCAR, uh, last year's champion, Kyle Larson. Other Valvoline drivers include friend of the channel, Chris the Force Forsberg, one of the greatest Formula Drift drivers ever. And Valvoline is also the official motor oil of grid life. So join the Valvoline Motorsports family today. Get some Valvoline in your car. Thank you very much, Valvoline, for sponsoring this episode. Nice. Nice. Yeah, I put a little spice on it. That was I a put a little grovel in my voice. Yeah, you changed your inflection yeah. at the end, letting people get pumped up. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. my hey, let's get excited tone. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I start with like a the factual, almost like NPR mm -hmm. kind of inflection, mm -hmm. and then it's time for bass gas. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> Jerry, hey buddy, Jerry's in the studio this week. I am. James is, uh, you know, he's taking some time off. It's all good. He's out. I'll step in. Yeah. I'll try to do my best pump. You've done a few past gas. I, I, I don't yeah. know if we've done it together, though. Maybe once or twice. Usually I'm the one who's out of town because I was traveling to Chicago pretty often. Yeah. Um, let's see. I think I did PT Cruisers. That's right. That was I years did, ago. Uh, yeah. I did an ice cruiser. Oh, yeah. Okay. That was when, yeah, when James first had his heart attack. You yeah. had to step in. Yeah. yeah. 
Was, and uh, yeah, I'm back. You're back. Back in the saddle. Yeah. Thanks Jerry, for having me. Yeah. Well, th thanks for coming on. Jerry and I have been spending a lot of time this week together. Yeah. I heard you guys rode a really dangerous vehicle yesterday. Yeah. yeah we bought, well, there's this very dangerous vehicle out there called a three wheeler. <laughs> and is that the technical name? <laughs> yeah. The technical name is three wheeler. What does ATC actually stand for? <laughs> That's a great question and something I should know. I don't know. I just, Probably all-terrain something? Yeah, maybe. It's an ATV, all-terrain vehicle with three wheels. Honda made them in the 80s. They're banned by the U.S. government. All-terrain cycle. It's still, oh, because tricycle. Yeah, 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 okay, yeah, yeah. I get it. Yep. And it's, uh, you know, they put a lot of people in the hospital. Over half a million people got injured on what? these things over the course of... Half a million people went to the hospital. So just how many people, like, <laughs> actually also got mangled but did not, like, and chose not to go to the hospital? Yeah, you or know? lied about <laughs> it. Imagine it, like, you got hurt on it and was just like, no, I fell off my bike. Yeah. Because you didn't want to be uh, the guy who crashed his buddies or your, yeah. your dad's uh, three-wheeler. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so... You know, in true donut fashion, we decided to buy one. <laughs> <laughs> we bought we bought one. We did a series of uh, dangerous tests out in the desert to yeah. test if it really was that dangerous. And you're gonna have to watch the video to find out. But it's a little spoiler. It's pretty pretty hairy vehicle. Yeah, it's yeah. a pretty it's a pretty hairy vehicle. <laughs> I wish yeah. we could have gone to the. There's an ATC 250R takeover in Oregon this weekend. Wow, a and takeover. I, I get. I they're on the dunes or on the beach or something, but. Uh, that would have been fun. I, I didn't know that Kawasaki also made Someone's one, and also Yamaha did yeah. too. Yamaha, Kawi, they all made versions of it. Honda, though, sold the most. They, like, dominated the market back in the 80s. I mean, it looks the coolest to me. It looks like an evil Knievel yeah. motorcycle from the 70s where it's just, like, red, white, and blue, or <laughs> yeah. red, yellow, and blue. Yeah. It really does look like it's from a different time uh, mm -hmm. because it is, but it. I don't know. It's very... It's it is it's just like distills down the eighties for me into yeah. like one thing where it's like, hey The gold yeah. wheels yeah. are really cool. Yeah, the gold wheels are cool. And it's um yeah, it's I think the thing that is most interesting to me about this and we'll talk about it in the video if you watch it, is you instantly get on it and just try to turn it going very slow and it instantly wants to tip over. Yeah. So you would think someone would be like, hey, this is a bad design. We shouldn't probably sell these things to kids, right? And they're like, nah, come we on. We could spend money on R&D or we could paint the wheels gold. <laughs> yeah. And that's what they did. Yeah. So uh, it'll be a fun one. Nolan came out there. Yeah, it was really hot. Um, hot as crap. And you guys got some claim jumper afterwards? Oh, yeah, we went to claim <laughs> jumper. That's right. So I was a little sick this morning. I got shrimp. <laughs> only guy at the table that got shrimp. Yeah, I was and the only one. What an idiot. <laughs> what an idiot ordered shrimp. Where were we? we what were was in, it? Over in uh, Antelope Valley. Antelope Valley. In the middle of the desert. <laughs> in the middle of the desert. <laughs> yeah. Miles away from an ocean. Yeah. That, and even, even a freezer truck gets thawed out on the way to that fucking desert shithole. <laughs> You rallied to make it here. I, you know what? You think I'm gonna miss a pod yeah. opportunity with the boys in person? <laughs> if this were Zoom, I would have called in. Yeah. But you know what? <laughs> to be here in your face. So your yeah. your claim that you're jumping is uh, biggest mud pie. <laughs> <laughs> and I kept calling it clam jumper. Oh, God. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> We were trying to go to Yard House, and I was like, well, there's a clam jumper next door. Let's just go over there. <laughs> they really hide that eye in the name. If I'm Big being shout honest. out to the staff of the Antelope Valley <laughs> yes. clam jumper. They were cool as shit. Yes. Yeah. Dealing with, or just putting up Seven with our, dudes deep. We walk in there. bits the whole time. Bits the whole time. Of, of course, the, can we keep going on this? Because I feel like this is a necessary story. This young waitress comes up. She's like, are we uh, celebrating anyone's, uh, any birthday or anything? Oh, yeah, yeah. And Max Maddox, our, one of our producers, uh, he goes, uh, we're celebrating creating content. <laughs> yeah. That's such a Max thing. Yeah. 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 And then, and then the other Max, Max Schneider, hits this. We just sat down. We literally got Hits there, like, this lady with a fuck, Mary kill, BJ's, claim, <laughs> <laughs> the claim yard job? house, and cheesecake. And cheesecake right? oh, factory. Wow. Yes. So she kills BJ's instantly, right? Why? I don't know. She she had, Southwestern egg rolls she and had, a bazooki? Are you she kidding had me? Major beef with BJ's. Major beef with BJ's. Okay, and so she's trying to figure out the next two, right? 
Oh yeah. We see her man. We see this manager like walking by, and she's like trying to figure out which one she's gonna either marry or out loud. F- yeah, yeah, marry or <laughs> yeah, fuck. Dude. As soon as her manager gets right here, she goes, "Well, I guess I'll fuck Cheesecake Factory." <laughs> 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 Damn, you might have got her fired. I, I, well, we better not know. We gave her like yeah. a fat tip. Give her a fat tip because she was really cool. Yeah. And I don't know, like you can't you can't fire her. She's like one of the no. best yeah. actresses there. She was great. She have was to great. imagine. Yeah. yeah. Well, Jerry, I'm glad you're in the studio today, feeling at least decent. You're eating some apples. It looks like I'm Nolan Sykes, joined by my co-host today. We got Joe Weber. What's up, Wink Wink Nation? And Jerry Two Berries Burton? Hey! hey. <laughs> I got two berries, and they're both Raz. <laughs> well, I guess it's a great time to let you guys know I only have one testicle. Wow. <laughs> because of a motorcycle accident? <laughs> because <laughs> yeah. it Or it hasn't dropped yet. It was a smelting accident. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, uh, gold. <laughs> I love gold. See, someone understands that the third Austin Powers is the best it's one. It's good. It's a good yeah. one. Yeah. It's a good one. Not the best one, let's be honest. <laughs> but a good one. I have to watch all of them again and f- find out. Okay, so Jerry, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, this week, we are talking, of course, about the Le Mans winning engineer, Lena Gade. So let's get into it. Lena Gade was born in Prevale, England in 1976, one of the three daughters of Indian immigrants. When she was nine years old, her family moved back to India in hopes of settling there. Around that time, Lena developed an interest in engineering. While living in India, Lena says that she and her younger sister, Tina, quote, would spend a lot of their time after school pulling things apart. Wait, Lena and Tina? Lena and Tina. Yeah. Their brother's name's Pina. (laughs) In an interview with NPR in 2014, Lena explained that, quote, it only was because the electricity always used to get turned off where we lived. You kind of get bored. Dad's toolkit was around, so just open stuff up. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Love that. That's funny. Despite being told that, quote, engineering isn't for girls, Lena ignored the naysayers and continued to tool around with anything she could get her hands on. Get girls into STEM. That's right. STEM, uh, science, technology, Engineering. And money. (laughs) Yeah. All right. After three years, Lena's family made the return to England when she was 12 years old. When they got back to school, they learned that everyone was getting into Formula One racing, especially Tina's classmates. One afternoon, Tina came home excitedly to present a plan to her sister to watch Formula One racing on TV that weekend. Great plan. That's what I'm going to be doing this weekend. That's such a fun plan, too. Like, we do brunch now and watch... Uh, Formula One races at Job's house, and mm-hmm. it's like the highlight of my week. It's pretty good stuff. They turned the television on and were immediately engaged by the commentators, former F1 driver James Hunt and racing enthusiast Murray Walker. The announcers were full of enthusiasm, excitement, and passion for the sport, and the Gade sisters were hooked from then on. Lena's ever-growing interest in engineering helped her convince her parents that she should attend the University of Manchester, where she would be studying aerospace engineering, and her sister went on to study mechanical engineering as well. Both Lena and her sister fully intended to use their respective degrees to get them into motorsport. A quick sidebar, Tina went on to engineer Chris Meek's mini John Cooper Works WRC car in the World Rally Championship. So the Gade gals are pretty much a legacy family. That's cool as shit. Yeah, that's really, really cool. cool. Dude. I like how one went to aerospace, the other one did mechanical. Their powers combined. You got the downforce arrow side yeah. of racing. You got the, you know, mechanical. I don't know. The what, other stuff. The other stuff that I studied that I don't remember. <laughs> you yeah. did mechanical? I did mechanical, nice, yeah. Dude. Mm-hmm. Did you ever think about going to Cal Poly, San Luis Obispo? I did not. Did you no. ever hear of that when you're over? Out did there it ever August? enter the conversation? No, but when I worked, when I got my first gig out here, um, when I moved to LA, because I, you know, graduated and well, I did graduate school. I did graduate, I did undergraduate in mechanical, graduate in biomedical. So I wanted to go work in the biomedical field. And I went, got a job out here, and everyone they hired was from Cal Poly. Cal Poly, yeah. Cal Poly Pomona, Cal Poly San Luis, you know. Yeah. Lots of smart kids, yeah. lots of smart engineering kids. Polytechnic University. Yeah. Just a quick background on me and Jeremiah. Mm-hmm. I met Jeremiah, well, <laughs> I met him over email. When we were both interning for 
uh, unpaid internship for a comedy theater out here. Yeah. And I didn't know that he had come from taking stem cells out of hearts <laughs> to becoming an unpaid intern that cleans toilets yeah. at a comedy theater. <laughs> yeah. During the day, I was in a manufacturing suite, uh, literally dissecting hearts, growing stem cells to use as a therapy for people who had heart disease. And by night, I was cleaning toilets <laughs> at a uh, comedy theater. For free. <laughs> For free, yeah. You get one class out of it. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what? The things you do, that's why I came out here, though. I came out here to try to be funny. I'm still working on it. Oh, I yeah. hope you get there, man. I, me too, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> Lena's intention was to become an aerodynamicist, but within the early part of her studies, she realized that testing models in the wind tunnel was a daunting and difficult task. She knew that even if aerodynamics weren't her future, her master's degree would still be helpful in a career in racing. In a very small class of 100 students, Lena was just one of five women. By the time she applied for her master's, she was the only woman left. She graduated in 1998 with a master's in aerospace engineering. Lena's desire to learn was still strong, and now she was ready to learn the ins and outs of high-powered vehicles. After graduation, she got a job as a vehicle refinement engineer for Jaguar and worked for them for six and a half years. For Lena, Jaguar was a crash course in working with actual vehicles. And while she was getting a great education on the ins and outs of cars, Lena realized she was ready to learn more about getting them on the racetrack. During that time, Lena met a man named Alan Harding, who worked for a company called AHS Motorsports. I'm wondering if that A and H... Stands for Alan Harding. <laughs> Probably. Alan recruited her to help him work on some Formula V cars, which were stored in a small garage on a farm. Formula Vs are like these small, super small open race, open wheel race cars. The flat four from a VW. That's right. They're uh, not the fastest, but you learn a lot about uh, driving. I want one. I know. You How could, much are they? You could probably get one for under 10 grand pretty easily. Dude, that's yeah. great. I'm going to be looking those up this evening. <laughs> <laughs> Alan and his one on-site mechanic would buy engines from factories and build them to be race ready. Although the work was unpaid, Lena was finally learning how to get a race car track ready, and that was invaluable to her. This helped bring her one step closer to her dream of being at the racetrack. Lena made working for AHS Motorsports her side hustle during her time at Jaguar. Determined to sink her teeth into racing, she went to every race she could for two years. Around this time, Lena started to freelance for various teams and eventually turned her side hustle into a main hustle. She did data work with a Formula BMW team and took part-time gigs with A1 Grand Prix as well as GT racing classes. She was doing everything. Lena seemed to get most of her gigs through word of mouth and a growing reputation as a quality engineer. Hell yeah. Sigma grind set. That is that Sigma grind set. You know, I get hit up all the time on Instagram about people who are like, hey, I... I really like cars and engineering, but they mm -hmm. don't offer like race engineering school yeah. and stuff. And I, my response is always like, well, no, they don't do that. But mechanical engineering or some form of engineering and just a ton of dedication. She did. She went to races for two years, like, you know, straight. Yeah. Ask questions and bug people. Yeah. And a lot of people bug teams, but then they're not dedicated to it and they mm -hmm. fall off but if you're dead you know they show it's just like anything else if you just show your face and show you're genuinely mm -hmm. interested in it and want to pursue it then you know because because the engineering degree as funny enough it just lets people know like hey you have the capacity to learn certain mm -hmm. things that we're going to teach you yeah. like while yeah. you're in the you know and soon enough one team's going to need someone to schlep stuff around or <laughs> yeah you know yeah. you start Start at the bottom and yeah. and show that you're a hard worker, and then you can be a race tech. I mean, the first uh, like road race event I ever did, I was just a guy. Uh, I did refueling, but also just like held, literally just held a fire extinguisher during pit stops mm -hmm. for a team. But it was during the 25 hour of Thunder Hill, so it was like I did like an eight hour shift in the middle of the night doing that, and then now like I spot for them. You yeah, know? like you can. You're going to probably start out doing a small job like that that you think is, like... Beneath you. If you think it's beneath you, then probably don't... Racing probably isn't for you because <laughs> you're going to have to start that low, but, like... Or anything. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Nolan went from holding a fire extinguisher to, to spotting to driving and winning the Mario Cup. That's right, yeah. <laughs> 
Um, so yeah, just uh, just you got you got racing. You very much gotta like take initiative and get out there. No one's gonna like hit you up in the DMs randomly and be like, "Hey, you want to like change tires on our team?" You gotta make that happen for yourself. And it sounds like that's what Lena did. Most people think that finding great talent is harder than trying to get James to read some of these ads. But with Indeed, it's as easy as getting Nolan to read ads. When you're hiring, you need Indeed. And here's why. Indeed is the hiring platform where you can attract, interview, and hire all in one place. Instead of spending hours on multiple job sites searching for candidates with the right skills, Indeed's a powerful hiring partner that can help you do it all. Find great talent faster through time-saving tools like Indeed Instant Match, assessments, and virtual interviews. With Instant Match, over 80% of employers get quality candidates whose resume on Indeed matches their job description the moment they sponsor a job, according to Indeed Data US. As someone who hires writers all the time, uh, the Instant Match is a feature that I really love. Everything's in one place, and they make it so easy to hire the quality candidates you're looking for all the time. With Indeed assessments, you can select for the skills that matter to you the most. Add from a selection of over 100 hard and soft skill tests to your job post and hone in on the candidates with the right skills faster. Start hiring now with a $75 sponsored job credit to upgrade your job post at Indeed.com slash PassGas. Offer good for a limited time. Claim your $75 credit now at Indeed.com slash PassGas. Indeed.com slash PassGas. Terms and conditions apply. Need to hire? You need Indeed. When summer starts to wind down, fall can get a bit chaotic. But Factors Ready to Eat Meal Delivery makes it easy to stay on top of a busy schedule while sticking to my goals. Factors the perfect meal solution for any on-the-go lifestyle. Whether it's a quick lunch at my desk between meetings or a fully prepared dinner that I didn't have time to shop or prep or clean up after. They've got me covered for weeks when free time just isn't a thing. Factor makes lunch and dinner on busy days a total breeze. Their fresh, never frozen meals are delivered ready to heat and eat in two minutes so I can fuel up fast and get on with my day. Factor's new Protein Plus preference makes it easy to power up with deliciously satisfying meals with 30 grams of protein or more. Factor now offers 30 plus meals per week and 33 plus add-on options like smoothies, juices, snacks, and more to keep me going all day, every day. We got a shipment of Factor's smoothies into the office the other day and they're delicious, they're filling. It's perfect for like a meal replacement on the go when you just don't have time to eat. Head to go.factor75.com slash gas130 and use code gas130 to get $130 off across six boxes. That's code gas130 at go.factor75.com slash gas130 for $130 off. Thanks, Factor. In 2006, at the age of 30, Lena was recommended to work with the Chamberlain Synergy prototype team at the 24 Hours of Le Mans. This would be her debut in a race that would someday define her legendary career. Before we get into Lena Gade's journey in the 24 Hours of Le Mans throughout the years, let's talk about the women of motorsport who ran the race before her. Since its inaugural race in 1923, the automotive group Automobile Club de l'Ouest advocated for equality by letting both men and women participate in the race. Pretty groundbreaking stuff considering how male-dominated racing was and continues to be today. In 1930, Le Mans saw its first female drivers compete, Frances Marguerite Marus and Odette Sicco. These two women are also part of the best-performing all-female team in Le Mans history. They placed seventh in their Bugatti Type 40 in 1930. Sicco, for her part, is considered to be the first lady of Le Mans, as her fourth place in 1932 remains the best result ever achieved by a woman at Le Mans. Although Le Mans was a race that advocated for inclusivity, there was a period of time that the safety of women became a top concern. After the death of Annie Bousquet at the 1956 12-hour of Reim, the ACO suspended the permission of female participants in the race. It wouldn't be until 1971, 14 years later, that women were allowed back on the track. Dude, Annie Bousquet looks exactly like like Elizabeth Moss. Oh, I, th- I smell a movie they brewing. They should make a movie for sure. Elizabeth Moss as Annie Bousquet. That's a winner. Get Hollywood on the phone. Oh, Hello, no, Hollywood. Hollywood. <laughs> uh, oh, sorry. <laughs> 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 
<laughs> I thought I was calling Hollywood. I was gonna just oh, calling yeah. Nolan. I just, I just, I just did one of those prank phone calls where you call a shop that's calling the same shop. And you you did that? Together. No, but you know how like yeah. that's what people do. They're like. You call a pizza place yeah. and be like, hey, talk to my uncle. And on the other line, yeah, yeah, you have yeah. another pizza place. to go, hey, what do you need? What do you need? Yeah. yeah. We want to do that with uh, we buy your junk car guys. <laughs> yeah, we should do that. I don't know. It's weird. It's this whole like women, we we care about women's safety, but guys. Yeah, it's like. Fuck them. Well, I mean, I think that's obviously pretense to be like, eh, we don't want women in here anyway. Yeah, it's I think that's like, a bullshit excuse. Totally. Yeah, for total sure. bullshit. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, like, every other weekend, like, <laughs> dudes are getting, like, yeah. decapitated right. and, like, right. you know, it's just dismembered a, and otherwise mangled. Mm -hmm. But one woman dies and they're like, well, tired gender. No, nope. we're going to run out of babies if this keeps happening. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, 1971 was when they started letting women uh, race again. A return due in large part to the women's liberation movement. Oh, yeah, women. Shortly after that, the French driver Anne Charlotte Verney made her first Le Mans appearance in 1974. She still holds the record for a female driver with the most entries in Le Mans after competing in the race 10 consecutive years Damn. from 1974 to 1983. Wow. Some other well-known competitors are Christine Beckers, Lella Lombardi, and Marie-Claude Beaumont. All these names are fantastic. I love them, dude. <laughs> Lella Lombardi. <laughs> La, 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 la. And Charlotte Vernet looks like, what's her name? She's, she was in a. Cypher? Yes. Yes. <laughs> yeah. What's her name? She's in, Mon <laughs> in Monster, Fast and Furious. Charlize Theron. Charlize Theron. Thank you. Yeah. Charlize Theron as Anne Charlotte Vernet. Yeah. That's okay. a winner right there. Can we Hello, get Hollywood. Hollywood. <laughs> uh, Hollywood? Oh, it happened again. Oh, my God. Dude, we got to stop using the same phone. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> I would absolutely love if Nolan went off and wrote a script and I want to. Yeah, I yeah. I'm serious. Like yeah. this would be great. Yeah. Now's Dude. the time, baby. Um so basically it's like uh Austin Powers 3 meets <laughs> meets Rush. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I want Shirley Theron. Who's the other lady? Uh Elizabeth Moss. Elizabeth Moss. Elizabeth man. Moss. And I'll be I'll be in it if it's okay. I'm the guy who kisses both well, of them. Well, I just want to be the guy, like, I'm the mechanic that, like, comes out from underneath the car and then, like, takes his rag out and starts, like, wiping his hands, like, I don't know, I did everything I could for you. I don't know if it's working. Yeah. Come over here. Give me a quick kiss. No, yeah. no, I'm not that both kind of you. kiss. Both of you. And then they go, mm -hmm, and then, and then when they- They weren't even alive at the same, like, time. Like, yeah, yeah, that's why this is sense. weird. <laughs> yeah, one of them's dead, which is, oh, yeah. why are you kissing yeah. a dead person? Yeah. <laughs> and then when uh, Roger Ebert reviews it, because he's alive. <laughs> he's alive yeah. in this. <laughs> It'd be like, the movie was fantastic minus one scene yeah. that make any, Doesn't make any sense. sense it seems the writer of this film inserted himself as some sort of fantasy yeah. also You're when creepier yeah. ta tarantino yeah. Yeah. <laughs> also when beaumont wins uh the mechanic goes i love gold <laughs> <laughs> do i make you randy baby oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> Two thumbs down. <laughs> Le Mans has also included all female teams since its early days. There have been 29 all female squads and two all female teams that have won in their class. The highest number of all female squads was in 1935 with four teams. And in recent history, Tatiana Calderon, Sophia Florsch, and Catherine Leger became the first all-female team to compete in the LMP2 class of the race. As of the 2022 Le Mans, 65 female drivers have competed and represented 15 countries, and in 2022, five female drivers competed in the race. There was also one all-female squad, an Italian team called the Iron Dames. And that's our super brief summary of some of the women who have contributed to Lena's rise in motorsport. In 2006, Lena Gade was unknowingly about to make a breakthrough in her future in racing and her career with Audi when she went to Le Mans with Chamberlain Synergy. In an interview with Motorsport Magazine, Lena stated that year was, quote, the first time she really understood what Le Mans was. That was the first year Audi won with the diesel engine. We were running a Lola. And I remember seeing the impressive team construction at the back of the pits. She thought it would be good to work with those guys one day. 
Later in 2006, some of the Chamberlain Synergy mechanics talked Lena up to Audi's chief race engineer, Howden Haynes. Synergy at that time was working with a GT3 car, a Jaguar XK8. Man, that's probably a sick race looking race car right there. This was a car Lena knew inside and out due to her time at Jaguar. Then in 2007, Lena's dream of Sunday working with the Audi team came to fruition. She was hired. Lena went on to work with Audi sport team Joost. That's Joe E-S-T. Yoast? Yoast. Yoast. She was recruited to assist Haynes with on-track engineering. Lena's first time working with Haynes was at a race in St. Petersburg, and her make-or-break moment came about because of a manual fuel calculation. At that point, Lena hadn't even seen, let alone participated in, an ALMS race before. Towards the end of the race, the pressure was on to work out the amount of fuel necessary to take on their final pit stop. Howden was trying to compare calculations with Lena and was in awe when he saw her working it out by hand. Their numbers were only off by a small margin of each other. Despite the close number, Lena thought that she blew it, but Haynes trusted Lena's meticulous precision. Lena's aerodynamic smarts were finally leading her to her dream job. Lena clearly impressed the team as she went on to assist Haynes the following year at the 2008 Le Mans. In a journey documented in the documentary film Truth in 24, which you guys may have seen, uh, the neck-and-neck -neck race between Audi and Peugeot resulted in a win for Audi in their R10. This was the race Lena refers to as her first proper Le Mans. Meanwhile, afterwards, Lena was promoted to full-time engineer. Hell yeah, Lena. Lena's first time running a car was in 2010 at Silverstone. At the time, Lena was still new and full of self-doubt in her abilities as an engineer. The driving force behind her choice to continue on was the faith her crew had in her. On this, Lena said, quote, What I didn't know was that at some point during 2010, they had asked the drivers what they thought of the engineering teams and who they wanted for the next year. Out of the three crews, two of them said if they had the choice, they'd want me and one of the data engineers. So there you go, man. Sought after. She's killing it. Yeah. In 2011, the Audi R18 prototype that was originally set to run in other races, like the 12 Hours of Sebring, was finally ready to go. Unlike other coupe competitors in this class, the chassis on the R18 was not composed of two halves, but a single-piece construction for improved rigidity. Unibody? Basically. It sounds like, a, I think it's like a carbon monocoque kind of deal. It also featured a stabilization fin on the engine cover, Joe, as you mentioned. And a, I love fins. And a six-speed electronically controlled gearbox, a feature that saved weight by eliminating the pneumatic air system. Its V6 engine consisted of a hot valley configuration, meaning the engine exhausts uh, went inwards between the cylinder banks, so like over the top of the motor. Mm -hmm. Pretty crazy. Audi also chose to install taller and wider tires on the front, a lower rear wing, and aluminum splitters, and a small duct on the front of the car. So every detail worked together to craft one of the most legendary cars to hit the track at Le Mans. And look sick as heck. Yeah, this thing's baller, dude. Now, as for the team, it was made up of André Lottier of Germany, Benoit Trelouillet of France, and Marcel Fassler of Switzerland. These drivers became Lena's brothers-in-arms through her years racing at Le Mans. Lena also adopted an approach for her new team that she believes helped them stay focused during the race, one that was simple enough to say, but kind of difficult to do. Control the things we can control. Pretty good live, uh, saying for life, too. Control the things we can control, man. I like that. That's really good. I'm going to adopt that. I think yeah. about that whenever I get angry about stuff, mm -hmm. especially traffic. Can't yeah. control it. Why can't would you honk? It. Just do, just, you know. No need to add stress to your life. Yeah. You know, if you can't do anything about it. Mm -hmm. Lena later said, quote, her team recognized the level of inexperience in me, but they knew there was an entire team behind us that can help. This was the beginning of a trusting working relationship. Lena has publicly expressed nothing but love and respect for her team. They supported her and maintained honest and open communication throughout each difficult competition. And that brings us back to our opening, when in 2011, the team competed in their first Le Mans. The punctured tire in that final of those 24 hours was a true test of their abilities as a team, and their risks paid off. But it was a close one. Quote, all the pressure was on our mechanics to get it right, Lena said in an interview with NPR. It was one of those stops that wasn't perfect. They fumbled a little bit with the wheel nuts, but the car went back out with new tires, and the opposition hadn't seen it coming. 
After facing massive pressure and clear setbacks, 35-year-old Lena Gade officially became the first female engineer to win Le Mans. Real Boss. quick, is the engineer, is it the main, it's not the chief engineer, just a engineer on the team? She's the chief engineer, so she's like team principal almost. Gotcha. For this team. Okay, yeah. so she's the main one running the show yeah. of the engineering team. Yeah. Gotcha. And, you know, at the track, engineers, I mean, that's like the mechanics, uh, all that. Yeah. Right. When the historic win happened, Lena didn't even fully comprehend it at first. She said, quote, when the car crossed the finish line, I turned around and everyone else in the pit was crying, and I couldn't understand why. <laughs> if you want more information on this particular Le Mans, the film Truth in 24 2 tells the story of the Audi R18 TDI Ultra and its dramatic win at Le Mans. So check that out. Such a cool name. And easy to remember. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Whenever these endurance races come down to the wire, it's always so amazing to me. Like you have 24 hours. Yeah. And then it's 13 seconds that yeah. s- the split. I think that's. Yeah, that's definitely one of the most, like, surprising things about the races when you go out to them is, like, they really are, like, all the different classes are running the same pace for that amount of time. You know, Mm -hmm. it's rarely more than a minute difference. Yeah, and the thing is, like, that's why, I mean, if you were to count the number of laps over 24 hours, Mm -hmm. right, you're, like, tenths, hundredths faster per lap, which on a 24-lap, you know, they really like, start to add up. Yeah, it starts to add up. So that's why these guys, these engineers, are obviously like they're trying to find, you know, tenths, hundreds, yeah, you know, everything they do because over the course of 24 hours, that, you know, leads to a gap. What's even more amazing to consider is that like every team will have a major breakdown usually. Uh-huh. Like they'll have some huge issue. So like early in the race, you like if you break at the start of the race, you break something and you go down like five laps or even like half an hour there's a chance that you could still win yeah, because other teams will have the same issues later on in the race and you just, you just make back that time. Right. That's nuts. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. Uh, you've been down a couple of these 24. I've only done the 25 hour. That's the only long one I've done. Um, but like, what is the feeling around these? Race? I've never been to one. So it's I don't know. It's so weird. Like at the long ones, at least those stints in the middle of the night, like you're just sitting there and you're just seeing lights just go by in the dark, you know, like, because every car has, like, either, you know, LED strips on them or, like, mm-hmm. something on the top of the car that's, like, blinking in a certain way so you can tell it's that car. And it's... You, do you take, like, uh, sleep shifts? Yeah. So, like, after my shift was over in the middle of the night, that's when I went to the RV and, like, I slept from, like, I want to say, like, 2 in the morning to, like, 6 a.m. or something. But Sheesh. Yeah, you're pretty ragged at the end of those 20, like, the day-long races, and I don't know, it's just there's something, there's something so tranquil and alien, like, when the sun goes down, a lot of these racetracks that we go to don't have, like, lights, Mm -hmm. so you have to, like, you, you start to recognize all the different cars by their light setups and their sounds, too, so you're just watching lights dance around in the dark, you know? It's, and Beautiful it's visual. It's, it's weird, man. Yeah, yeah. I don't understand endurance racing at all. I don't like it. It's it's, like, it's so different. But like once yeah. you go to it, and especially if you're like crew on a team, like the sense of accomplishment after it's over is yeah, like really I bet. Cool. And I I should take it back. It's not that I don't like it. I I want to go to one and yeah. experience it because it's one of those things where it's like, yeah, it's, you, it's t- doing just do anything for yeah. twenty five hours straight. Literally, yeah. just pick anything. The first house that I moved out from my parents, uh, my roommate got PlayStation 2 and uh, <laughs> Gran Turismo. Yeah. And we would just smoke weed and do those 12 hour endurance races all the way through. Like legit 12 hours on a yeah. PS2. Yeah. Wow. Like maybe pause once or twice to go do something, like, you know, go to the Eat. bathroom or something. Mm-hmm. But we would like power through them. And I remember, like, the, you were talking about shaving tents off. Mm-hmm. Like, you get so comfortable with the track that 99% of the turns you do the same the entire time. And then you find this one little way to go that shaves off like a little bit of time and over 12 hours. You're just constantly you're just refining. Like, yeah. yeah. It's, but I remember that feeling of like, I, I would love to do this in real life yeah. and just keep going and like refine that driving line. Yeah. Yeah. We still got time, Joe. Yeah. And I got a ton of weed. (laughs) (laughs) 
big thank you to our sponsor this week, Valvoline. I've been rocking Valvoline in my car for years, and you should too. Valvoline's new Extended Protection Full Synthetic Motor Oil is our best oil ever. Valvoline Extended Protection is specially formulated with dual defense additive technology, which combines an innovative additive booster with a fortified detergent system. It protects against oil breakdown. It's 10 times stronger against oil breakdown. Let me clarify for you. As oil ages, it gets thicker and thicker due to thermal degradation. This oil right here, this Valvoline Extended Protection Full Synthetic Motor Oil, protects against that 10 times better than industry standards, and it helps your engine grow old without acting old. I've been rocking Valvoline in my Mustang for years now, and she's still running like a champ. I want a new car, but she's running so well that I can't really justify getting one. So thank you, Valvoline, for making that happen. Get Valvoline in your car today. Valvoline. Though Lena was the first female engineer to win the Epic race, she didn't stop with one. In 2012, Lena moved to Germany to work with Audi to help develop and engineer new race cars. Meanwhile, her team was still new, but obviously getting through those growing pains and succeeding as a result. Audi was running both hybrid and non-hybrid cars, and testing the new cars was a stressful endeavor. In January 2012, Lena was diligent about testing the car and preparing for every possible shakeup in a race. She knew that she'd need to know the ins and outs of the car, and the only way to figure it out would be to test the car over and over, like they do. While most of the Audi team acknowledged the importance, they were worked to the bone to an exhausting degree. Lena stated that if we were targeting 6,000 kilometers, it didn't matter what broke. You had to replace it, start again, keep going, to the point where it was soul-destroying. That's crazy. If you break down at 5,000 kilometers, you have to like replace the part, start from scratch again. Mm -hmm. I wonder if that's kind of the average of what they cover in 24 hours. Distance wise? Yeah, 6,000 kilometers. Yes, and yeah, it's probably a, a like one and a half over that. Though the preparation was taxing, it paid off for Lena and her team. Lena once said, in regards to her team's abilities, we learned how to be a really strong unit. We actually set the benchmarks for all the other car crews at Audi. As difficult as the race was, the grueling and endless amount of testing paid off in a second consecutive Le Mans win in the newly designed evolution of the original car, the R18 e-tron Quattro. That's a mouthful. <laughs> I've been, I drove uh, my girlfriend's Audi A3 e-tron, uh -huh. uh, and compared to the 4Runner, it's like a spaceship. <laughs> 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 that was like... Driving with one toe, you know, where you're just like, yeah. and it takes off. And then I yeah. get in my forerunner and I have to put my whole heel down on the pedal <laughs> just to get it to like get up to speed on the highway. This car was a hybrid version of another car Audi ran the same year. The R18 e-tron was a hybrid version of another car Audi ran that year, the R18 Ultra. The concept behind the e-tron was a pioneering achievement. Though the hybrid car was much more complex and its predecessor from 2011, its ultra-lightweight construction kept its weight the same. It's also noteworthy that the winning drivers, Lautere, Fossler, and Treyule, drove significantly faster than the previous year, averaging 133.26 miles per hour as opposed to 125.06. That's a significant improvement. Despite going faster, the R18 e-tron Quattro is 10% more fuel efficient. The success of the R18 e can I just call it the e-tron? <laughs> Let's get it called the e-tron. <laughs> the success of that, the e-tron continued. Lena and her Audi team went on to win the inaugural World Endurance Championship, a racing series that featured pro and amateur drivers competing in various endurance events the same year. Lena's second triumphant one at Le Mans, as well as the WEC win, proved that she and her team could not only adapt to the ACO's regulatory changes, but that they had staying power. Lena herself later said that that win meant a lot because I didn't want us to be the one hit wonder like Len that same year, 2012, so like Len, <laughs> <laughs> What? what's that? That song is, uh, they, they're in the convertible in the music video, right? I like girls that wear every crime and fish. Is that them? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and I, bep, 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 cause you're still my sunshine. <laughs> yeah. All right. Sorry. Continue. <laughs> That same year, 2012, Lena was named, ironically enough, the FIA Man of the Year. 
Whoa. That Whoa. sucks. Just change it to woman of the year. <laughs> Whoa. Huh. On the award itself, Lena has said, a fair few people have asked if I was offended when I received it. I wasn't. CNR Racing Women in Technology Award, an accolade supported by motorsport specialist CNR Racing as a part of the U.S.-based Women in the Winner's Circle Foundation. In 2013, Lena was named an ambassador for the FIA Commission for Women in Motorsport, which helps to promote and encourage women to participate in the sport. And in 2014, Lena Gade and her Audi team won their third and final win at Le Mans in the newest version of the R18 e-tron Quattro. The trio of drivers Lena worked with, Marcel Fossler, André Lautaré, and Benoit Treyule, worked together to give Audi their 13th Le Mans victory. Throughout their time together, Lena's team always showed her the utmost respect. Lena once said, I'm not treated differently to anyone else on the team, and I was given an opportunity to take on a role that would be tough whether you are male or female. Towards the end of 2015, Lena made the decision to leave Audi. Lena didn't see much room for growth within the company and was fairly burnt out from the high octane racing world. Her last race with the team was at the her last race with the team was a 2016 Le Mans. Which she was also, which was also Audi's final year of the race before they pulled, out, uh, which was also Audi's final year in the race before they pulled out to focus on Formula E. In 2016, Lena went on to work for Bentley, taking on a newly designed role that had her look over its customer teams competing worldwide. Interesting. In 2018, she began working for IndyCar driver James Hinchcliffe on Schmidt Peterson Motorsports' number five car, but left the team fairly quickly after Hinchcliffe did not qualify for the Indy 500 that year. Hinch. Hinch, you blew it, baby. Hinch didn't clinch. Hinchtown, welcome to Hinchtown, baby. In 2019, Lena helped engineer the number 77 Mazda RT24P Daytona prototype in the WeatherTech Sports Car Championship. Later in 2019, Lena was appointed president of the FIA GT Commission, overseeing global Grand Tour racing. In 2021, Lena Gade became McLaren Racing senior race engineer on their Extreme E team for its inaugural entry into the 2022 season. Wow. Really worked her way up. Damn. Although Lena is undoubtedly worthy of role model status, the engineer has always shied from the spotlight. On her career, Lena once stated, quote, I was given a job and was told to go and win a race, and that's what I did. But it is different because there aren't other women doing it on a daily basis. If there were, we wouldn't be talking about it. Although her time in the spotlight may have made the predominantly private Lena a bit uncomfortable, she still takes pride in the work she has done. Since she made her mark on motorsport, there has been more of a female presence both on the racetrack and in the pits. Lena has paved the way for more women in racing and sees the notable change as a good thing, saying, quote, I noticed at Daytona this year, the paddock had more female mechanics and engineers around, and my data engineer is female. In a way, change like that is a gradual process. If you force it, sometimes it doesn't happen. If there's one thing to take away from Lena Gade's story, it's that diligence, drive, and the desire to control the things you can control are essential components to a legendary career. Good takeaway. Yeah. Good stuff. Great story. Lena Gade, what a role model. cool. Super sick. Very cool. All right, we got some fan mail this week. This is from Grace. Hey, Donut Media team. I love your podcast. Although I like the episodes on people, I was hoping you guys could do more episodes on the history of car brands or category. For example, I'd love to hear about the history of roadsters like MGB, Lotus, Miata, MX-5 in America, or what the heck happened to Geo, and why is the Geo Tracker and Suzuki Sidekick basically the same car? I listen to your podcast regardless. Just thought it'd be cool to hear about some of the cars us regular car nerds see out on the streets. Cheers, Grace. Well, thank you very much for the uh, email, Grace. Thanks, Grace. Yeah. Uh, if you'd like to hit us up, hit us up at pascas at donutmedia.com. Maybe we'll read your email on air and we will look into that geo company if you want to hear about. Yeah. You got your Metro, you got your Prism, you got your Tracker. I'm a geo head. I'm a geohead. I'm a geo. You're dude. geocacher. No, that's Max. <laughs> you love geocaching, dude. I really don't. Did you like ever it. do that? Well, I do it with Max sometimes. Like we'll you be guys traveling. Still do it. Well, whenever I'm traveling with Max, he'll be like, "I bet there's some geocaching here," <laughs> and then we'll like cry, we, climb we into Portland. like some weird yeah thing. Didn't you go in Portland with him? No, you didn't. He went so. geocaching with someone. 
Oh, maybe he showed Alex. me his geocaching login thing. What? He's done it like 1,300 yeah, times. Yeah, he does it a lot. I had no idea. I've never he's seen him put something in a place, though. He's a taker. He's, he's a, a taker, taker, not a giver. Yeah. But it's always some note that's like, you sign your name and you put it back. Hey, put it's your like, name here. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> that's kind of a fun, like, pre-social media kind it's, of thing that was harmless. around. It's great. It's, yeah. Huh, maybe when we go to Milwaukee. Oh, for sure. We, there's... I guarantee you there's uh like a little crack or something underneath the bronze fonts that there's like a note oh, that you yeah. sign your I bet Milwaukee's got a lush geocaching <laughs> environment. Yeah. I geocached once with my ex girlfriend and her sister and I was like, What are we doing? I didn't get it. Yeah. You know, this was like two. It was years like Pokemon ago. Go, but for yeah notes that for you notes. write your name on. Yeah. Or like a USB drive that's very dubious that you don't want to like put yeah. into your computer. Yeah, no one's got a bunch of those <laughs> dark web filled material. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Silk Road and such. Yep, they arrested that guy. Thanks for listening. All right, check yeah. out our <laughs> our Instagram, Jeremiah Burton. Mm-hmm. Nolan Sykes, Nolan, Nolan J. Sykes. J Sykes. Thank you, Joe and Joe G Weber. If you've never seen our faces, check out. Donut Media on YouTube. Subscribe to the channel. We have another podcast now. Yeah, DRS, Donut Racing Show. Donut Racing Show. Yeah, if you like Formula One, uh, the show is hosted by myself and Alanis King and Elizabeth Blackstock. We talk about Formula One, um, and I'm really stoked on that. So check that out. Um, All right. Have a good day. Later. Bye.